All right, whenever you're ready. Hey, hi everyone. I'm Al Brown. I'm a senior lecturer at the ASU Fulton Schools of Engineering and Environmental Resource Management degree program and have been working with uh, Ms. Marie Schneider for at least a semester now on uh, her applied project. She's going to be the star of the show, but uh, let me also introduce quickly Dr. Larry Olson, who is our recently retired ERM program chair and is now ASU Professor Emeritus. So Dr. Olson, would you like to say anything? It's good to see you, Maria. I'm looking forward to this. I'm, I'm glad you were able to make it because you're the one I first approached to, to discuss the possibility of doing this. So I'm, I'm glad. And so uh, Marie has uh, made the choice to do an applied project, which is uh, more than most students are doing for their master's degree. So congratulations and thank you very much for your extra level of effort on doing an applied project instead of just a comprehensive exam or a portfolio. Those are other choices. Uh, and also uh, her project is distinguished by some uh, original research and uh, surveys and interviews with uh, subject matter experts, which I'm, which I'm sure she will be going through here. So uh, with, uh, without further delay, uh, Marie, you wanna take over? Yeah, um, I can give a quick introduction of a um, couple special guests. So um, Norm Brunton, he is with the Reuse Marketplace, which is one of the uh, case study uh, interviews that I did um, as part of my research. And uh, I have Daniel uh, Kietzer here from the uh, United States Business Council for Sustainable Development. His, um, his group does is the nonprofit that is um, in charge of the, the materials marketplaces. So they are working with the Arizona Department of Environmental Quality to um, start implementing this, uh, this marketplace. So I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. All right, so my project is a study of the feasibility of this materials marketplace in Arizona. Marie, I'm sorry to interrupt you. I had my microphone turned off. And I noticed there's a bunch of other people or several other people who um, are your invited guests. Do you think you could please introduce them? Oh, yeah, sorry. <laughs> I, I know them really well. Yeah, let me pull this up. Let me stop sharing. Um, so I have a couple of my classmates here that were... Um, teammates with me on the uh, sol sustainable solid waste uh, project for the city of Peoria, Arizona, where we uh, looked at uh, styrofoam recycling. Um, so we have uh, Alexis and Claire. They were amazing teammates. Thank you so much for, uh, for taking a little bit of time to come to this. Hi, Dr. Um, Olson. <laughs> <laughs> um, and uh, my two other guests, uh, my mom, Jeanette, is here. Um, she's a she's an architect, and um, my sister Stephanie Basker is also here for support. Um, no donuts, no cookies. Uh, I wish. <laughs> it's a little hard to share, though. So I'll just share my screen. Okay. There we go. Okay. Um, yeah. So um, my. Uh, my project is a study of the feasibility of this materials marketplace as a method to encourage circular economy in Arizona. So this has been a little look at my life for the past several months. Uh, so I'm going to talk a little bit about um, what circular economy is as a, an economic model and what are some of the, uh, the methods that people use to, uh, to encourage this, this development. Um, I'm going to look at the Arizona industry, what, um, what the big industries in Arizona are, and uh, try to look at how much waste they're producing and as, um, that could be potentially put through the marketplace. I'm going to go over some of the, the programs, the Pollution Prevention Program with the Arizona Department of Environmental Quality, ADEQ. Um, that is a program that's already implemented. And then I'm going to discuss a little bit about what the materials marketplace is and um, some of their uh, successes. And then I'm going to go over the case studies and look at what other waste exchange programs have done or are doing, uh, what some of the challenges they have are, um, some of their best practices as well. And, and then I'm going to go over an industrial recycling survey that I conducted throughout the state of Arizona and uh, that was looking at how much waste, come on, let me, 
Uh, so it was looking at how much waste Arizona businesses currently recycle and reuse. And then finally, I will have a discussion um, about the potential concerns and the challenges, the needs of a waste exchange program here in Arizona. So a circular economy is essentially looking at linear model models versus circular models. So a linear model is where we have our, uh, we take a resource, we make a product, it is used and consumed, and then it's wasted. So the circular economy is really an attempt, uh, it's attempting to turn that you know, into a circle where we have we take the uh, the material, whether it is raw or um, reused, and we produce, we, we manufacture with it, we use it, and then instead of wasting, we take as much as we can and we re-enter it back into the economy re, re, uh, versus via reuse, uh, recycling, or repairing it. Um, and as individuals, as industries, and as a government, there are different methods that we can do um, and different practices we can implement in order to make this um, a reality. So for individuals, there are curbside recycling programs as drop-off and collection events. Um, and you can also make a habit of purchasing secondhand and thrift items to, incur to, um, to encourage that, that circular motion and keep things moving through um, through the, the, the use portion of the model. The government can prioritize renewable energies and raw material sources, and they can administrate and encourage programs that incentivize recycling and alternative waste solutions. For industries, they can alter their processes to reduce surplus and waste, and they can uh, source some of their materials from uh, waste streams through recovery and reuse. So just a quick look at Arizona industry. Uh, the Arizona Commerce Authority breaks it down into four sections, four major sectors of industry. So we have aeros uh, aerospace and defense, which brings in about $12.2 in DOD contracts alone, and there's also a $3 billion optics industry. Uh, technology and innovation, we have some very large technology um, companies here in Arizona with over 132,000 uh, indus uh, tech industry jobs. Um, manufacturing, we have major manufacturing facilities. We have Honeywell, Raytheon, Intel, Ball, um, and we are uh, projected to be number two in manufacturing job growth throughout the United States. Bioscience and healthcare and business and financial services, film and digital media, these are all major, um, major industries in Arizona, although we're mostly going to focus on those first three because that's where a lot of the, uh, the industrial waste is coming from. So we can break down um, the industries a little bit more and take a look at their, the value that they're adding to the Arizona GDP. So relative to the amount of waste that manufacturing is um, more likely to produce, it adds a much smaller value, only about 10% or $28.4 billion to the Arizona um, economy. Um, but the problem is industrial waste is difficult to quantify and track uh, for three main reasons. So the first reason, um, industries don't generally like to share their uh, waste production. And it's a, a PR, um, public relations issue. They, it's harder for consumers to understand the massive amounts of waste that are being produced on the industrial scale. And hearing that a company is producing you know, thousands of tons a week or a month or whatever it be, is it doesn't look good for the company, even if that number is pretty mild compared to um, com comparable industries. So there's a lack of reporting of waste. And so we really have to just rely on estimates. The EPA estimates, um, the, the most recent EPA estimate was from the 80s. And they said about 7.6 billion tons of industrial waste was being produced annually. Um, there was another estimate about a max of 12 billion. So huge numbers, but unfortunately we just, it's just one of the downfalls of being involved in the industrial waste uh, sector and, and trying to research and look at this, that there's no reporting there. You have to rely on the goodwill of companies to get their, their data. Um, 
Additionally, ad um, industrial waste is uh, difficult to track because each different types of waste has different properties and those different properties give them different values. So to what may be valuable monetarily to one company is not to another company. So it makes it difficult to really understand and, and track where all this material is going as it changes, as it goes through treatments and um, gets different chemical properties. So um, the Pollution Prevention Program is with the um, Arizona Department of Environmental Quality, ADEQ. Well, and we'll refer to this as P2, just for simplicity's sake. So the, the P2 program is designed to help industries reduce their, um, their waste outputs and their energy and water consumption. It, is a, it can be either a voluntary program or it's required depending on uh, different amounts and different types of waste that is produced by a facility in a year. So for example, if they use more than 10,000 tons of a toxic substance in a county year, they are required to work with the pollution prevention program to design a plan to help them reduce that uh, toxic substance uh, usage. Or if they generate more than, um, or an average of uh, one kilogram per month of acutely hazardous waste, so very, very hazardous, or 1,000 kilograms of um, hazardous waste. So very dependent on, um, or the, the requirement to participate is very dependent on the amount of waste that they're producing. The P2 plan is really based on the um, waste uh, management diagram here. So this is a pretty commonly used diagram when you're uh, talking about um, uh, waste disposal and, and management. So the top four are what we really focus on for P2. It's avoidance, minimization, recovery, and co-processing. Um, the less desirable management, uh, waste management methods incineration, landfilling, and very much so the unmanaged waste. We want to avoid those as much as possible. So P2 plans often involve reducing the chemicals that you're using, implementing better spill and leak protection, um, recycling, changing processes to, um, to reduce amounts of chemicals that may be needed, um, and reclamation and substitution where possible. In Arizona, the P2 program is specifically um, majorly manufacturing companies with almost 50% um, of the companies involved in manufacturing. Others are, retail is also big um, and uh, bioscience and healthcare. Um, and the manufacturing and retail specifically as the largest groups in uh, the P2 program are largely focused on chemical reductions and substitution specifically, as well as equipment updates uh, for uh, energy efficiency reasons and recycling wooden pallets specifically. So wooden pallets either um, recycled as pallets or the wood taken apart and uh, recycled. And then replacing uh, paper with digital, for example, a uh, paper training manual is being replaced with digital modules. So um, in 2018, the Pollution Prevention Program saw a reduction of uh, about 5 million pounds of hazardous, toxic, and, and solid wastes. And uh, almost 170 million gallons of water conserved, 48 to million kilowatt hours of energy conserved for a total cost savings of over $12 million. And that's, that's really good. Um, the additional benefits for the program and for the companies involved are recognition from peers and their public, as well as a safer working environment for their employees. And um, even more so reduced regulatory obligations as they reduce waste to enough uh, to a low enough point that maybe they don't need to be regulated quite so heavily. Uh, Maria, was that just for Arizona? Yes, so this P2 uh, data is specifically for Arizona in 2018. Okay, thank you. So um, the other program we're going to take a quick look at is the Materials Marketplace. So this is the program that uh, the United States Business Council for Sustainable Development, the BCSD, as I'll refer to it, um, that they, they work with cities and states to implement this program. They currently have programs in Ontario, Canada, in Michigan, Tennessee, Ohio, and Austin, Texas, and they are currently working with Arizona. So this program is free for users, and it is essentially a listings website. So you can list um, materials that you have that are available, materials surplus, waste, et cetera, or you can list what you're looking for and uh, make connections that way. Uh, their outreach is mostly conducted through referrals from people who are already in the program, um, industry, industry and trade associations, and through the programs themselves as program administrators reach out to companies. Uh, they also offer waste and savings trackings that um, is updated real time. 
So as of November 30th, 2020, they have 2,557 active accounts across their, um, across their programs. And those accounts are split about a three way um, between uh, different groups. So about 42% of the accounts are looking to sell materials. About 32% are wanting to get materials and about 26% are looking for service and contract opportunities. When you look at um, the, the industries that these, uh, that these accounts are in, about 23% is manufacturing, 18 in wholesale trade, and 14% in waste management and remediation. So currently, the materials marketplace has seen over 6,500 tons of materials diverted and $1.3 million saved. This is mostly in glass, ceramics, organic chemicals, equipment, and furniture. So we're gonna look at some case studies that um, I conducted through interviewing um, program leads and directors and administrators for other waste exchange programs across the country. So the Southern Waste Information Exchange, known as SWIX, is a program that was originally based in Florida. The, the state of Florida conducted a feasibility study to look at what the potential usage of the program would be and what the need was. Um, and they looked at um, industrial classification codes to, uh, to, to find companies that they knew were likely to produce certain types of waste. And they mailed advertisements to those companies. This was back in the, um, the early 90s, about there, thereabouts. So they, they mailed advertisements to the companies and initially they were based on grant funding. As they grew, they got a lot more listings from out of state and they eventually changed the name to the Southern Waste Information Exchange, serving the entire EPA region for, so that um, if you see in the upper right hand corner, um, those, those states there. So SWIC serves a, um, a large number of industries. And as they grew, they learned that they needed more consistent funding. So the problem with grant funding is that you may get a grant one year, but not the next year. So they learned to be a little bit more flexible in the groups that they were applying to get grants from. They also branched out more. So aside from just having their, their model of listing available and wanted materials, they also would hold waste conferences and uh, workshops and training events to help uh, bring in money as well. And they offer waste and savings tracking so that companies who are participating can see what the success is and see the financial benefits from participating in the program. They do find that um, with the, the listings and the, the accounts that people make, confidentiality is, often, confidentiality is often preferred for these companies. And we'll revisit that a little bit later. So their annual success, this, um, from 2017 to 2018, they had 43,000 requests for information and over 178,000 page views. So a lot of people looking at the website, but not as many actually doing um, exchanges um, and uh, making connections. So they're working on, on increasing, making those connections, not just getting the views. Um, they've had almost 70,000 tons of waste diverted and have saved facilities in the area, a total of about $3.5 million. So the reuse marketplace um, was originally developed by college students as a, um, a system of classified ads. So again, sort of the, the Craigslist model. So the classified ads where they, um, they had listings for what was wanted and what was available. They offered tracking of the waste movement and the transactions. As they grew, they began partnerships with the EPA and with cities and states to develop their own uh, waste exchanges. So Reuse Marketplace really works with other groups to develop their own waste exchanges. Um, over time, as, um, as economies, the economy has gone up and down, they have decided to open up more services available to their clients. So they have started a directory with uh, a guide for waste management services. So they have their exchange and they also have the directory available for people to look at and, and refer in case they have a material that um, they need gone you know, right away. So there's different tools for different needs. They've, they find that for the, the classified ads, that is generally uh, best for materials that, um, uh, that is generally best for materials that uh, they want to make connections. They have a consistent large quantity of items that 
can um, help to make a connection between this business and this business. Um, and for the directory, if you have a waste, if a company produces a waste, um, and maybe it's in smaller amounts or it's an inconsistent production of this waste, they have the directory for the waste management services to come take care of that waste. Um, based on the, the economy, they, they've made the decision to, to start charging service fees because they're seeing a lot of um, success from their program and uh, businesses making money through selling their waste. So those who are uh, profiting from using a program should um, should help to support that program that's allowing them to make the money. So that, that's the, uh, the mindset behind uh, beginning to charge service fees. And they're also shifting to a full service program. So in addition to the classified ads and the directory, they're also starting a focus on surplus chain tracking. So we all kind of know a little bit about this, uh, the supply chain, where things are coming from, but the surplus chain is looking at where things are going. So you have a waste, where is it going? Where is it needed? Um, really tracking, uh, tracking that and understanding the business side of it. So some of the challenges are having that business experience and mindset is absolutely necessary for program administrators. They can't simply uh, rely on the software to uh, do the work for them and to uh, promote the program, but uh, programs really need promotion and marketing to make sure that activity stays up and stays consistent. The Iowa Waste Exchange is based in Iowa. Um, this is a little bit of a unique program. Um, it started as a, um, the based on speculation from um, the Department of Natural Resources, looking at other programs in the 80s that were popping up that was around the country that were doing similar things, so other waste exchange programs. And they said, well, if it works there, it might work here. And this was in response to a Groundwater Protection Act that Iowa passed in 1987. It implemented a waste, uh, a fee structure for waste disposal. So for every ton of waste that was being disposed by industries, they had to pay a fee. Um, so in order to provide industries other options than just landfilling their waste, they implemented the Iowa Waste Exchange. So this exchange is based on um, dividing the state into regions. Initially, it was 10 regions, so currently it is five regions, and each region is, given a, uh, is assigned a specialist. And these specialists, their entire job is to go out and find companies who can participate to help uh, to do waste assessments when needed and to look at what, um, what waste people may be missing in their processes and to give them new ideas about, um, about what can be uh, added, to the, added to the waste exchange. They provide resources for, for companies who are a little unsure about the regulations surrounding different types of waste. Uh, the challenges that this program faces is some wariness around extra government involvement. So you have government getting a little bit more involved in the companies. Um, so helping the companies to understand the benefits that this gives them. So really looking at the financial benefits because companies are heavily uh, reliant on their uh, on their bottom line, meeting that bottom line, making sure they're making money and saving money. So emphasizing that uh, financial gain to the companies helps to overcome some of that wariness around government involvement. Um, and the challenge is also finding new companies. So initially in 1987, it was pretty easy to find companies because the waste exchange was brand new. No one was really doing a whole lot of this uh, uh, alternative waste disposal and moving waste to different places other than the landfill. So there was a lot of low hanging fruit that, these, um, that the program was able to, to find all these big manufacturing companies that could put a lot towards the waste exchange. But now they're finding that after being around for so long, it's harder to find companies to keep the, uh, the listings up. And um, finally, the, the last challenge was the exchange activity and the economy. So as the economy goes up and down, the exchange activity goes up and down. So it varies from month to month. Um, and some years are better than others. So right now they've had uh, more than 12,500 listings and 16,000 plus matches. Um, they have been able to divert over 4 million tons of waste, including hazardous and construction and organic wastes. And they have been able to save uh, facilities and companies across Iowa and even some listings outside of Iowa, a total of uh, one uh, $117 million. Marie, before you move on to the next one, 
I'm not sure if I saw you any slides or heard you mention hazardous waste being uh, on the uh, list of things that could be exchanged in the previous waste exchange case studies. Uh, are, are they also dealing in hazardous waste or is this the first one that we're being told about? Um, it depends um, on the, the waste exchanges themselves. Most of them do allow um, hazardous waste um, uh, in, in addition to other solid waste and surpl uh, surplus materials. Um, in the end, it's really up to the company to decide what's to, what they want to list and for the other companies to decide if they want to accept it. So um, a lot of these programs offer uh, resources and um, uh, resources to help companies understand um, or to, to come up with ideas about things they can recycle. But um, I, I I'll, I'll discuss a little bit later the issues of liability that come with giving too much advice on a personal level or trying to get involved with these especially hazardous waste uh, transactions. Okay, that's good because that's a tricky one. So I'm glad you're going to be covering it. Yeah, it, it was definitely mentioned across, I think, all of the, the case studies that I did, for sure. Okay, keep on going. Um, so next we have the Resource Exchange Network for Eliminating Waste. This is a uh, Renew. They're based in Texas. Um, this model was salvaged from a 1990s listings manual that contained all the data for um, the, these various material listings. And as the manual got bigger, they decided that they wanted to switch to a website and that was launched in the early 2000s. The website was and is, and um, it's emphasized that it will continue to always be free for users. And um, they offer listings reviews especially for international listings, because they do get a few of those. So they're really careful about uh, making sure that the listings aren't scams and such. So that there have been a couple of those. So that is something to watch out for where, where people were suspicious that you know, maybe this isn't what it looks like. So again, we have um, issues of you know, what is okay to offer and what companies should be allowed to accept, but the program needs to not get too involved in that and, and simply provide resources for them to make those decisions themselves to make sure they're following regulations. Um, Renew finds that confidentiality is often preferred by these companies and for uh, for many of them it's actually a requirement like they, they absolutely require being uh, their listings and their company being uh, confidential on the website and that actually presents a challenge for Renew in that they don't get as many reported exchanges and successful transactions as they would like um, simply because they're they're not um, the, these exchanges are not being reported because the companies would prefer to be confidential. But in the end, it's not so much about what they're able to track, it's whether or not it's being tracked, these exchanges are happening and that's good. We want these exchanges happening. So if offering confidentiality makes companies more willing to participate, that should be the focus rather than no, but we want to track it. Um, in terms of promotion, Re Re Renew is doing some really good things. They um, do presentations at government meetings, at conferences, they go to trade fairs, and they also maintain a, a social media presence. And um, they, they have a, a Twitter account, and they're also working on Instagram to try to build a following there as, they, um, as Instagram's audience is, is uh, growing massively as much as Twitter. So they're, they're following where the audiences are going to promote this program. So Renew has had, um, they've had over 500 exchanges in the, um, in the year, and 500,000 plus tons of material that have been reused and recycled. They have helped facilities to save over two, uh, 27 million and earn over 15 million. So Reaply is a up and coming uh, program that they are a company and their model is um, a little bit different. They have the waste exchange, the, the sort of Craigslist uh, model, but they are also focusing on asset management. So looking at waste, not as waste, but as an asset, similar to the reuse marketplace, where they're really looking at that surplus chain and tracking where the, where the company's assets are going. So in terms of their services, they're offering a couple uh, additional, um, additional services that for their monthly fee and transaction costs to help cover these services. So they do offer rental options. So if a company wants to maintain ownership over a material or equipment, they can do so. But that way it's not just sitting there taking up storage space. Someone else is using it. So 
this other person doesn't have to go out and buy more materials and equipment. They have an in-app messaging system that allows for um, instant and direct uh, connections and a variety of search functions so that you can be very specific with the material that you're looking for. Um, they also offer sustainability reports like many of the others. So they are uh, very open and transparent about what the successes of their of their program are. It's still in the testing phase. They've launched a few um, testing programs and they've had really good successes. So they're hoping to be able to launch full time very, uh, very soon. Uh, so Reaply is designed to skip some of those common challenges associated with waste exchanges, looking at the cost preferences for raw over reused um, and maintaining interest in the program via having all these different services that they offer. Um, and the last case study that I looked at was the Arizona Resource Exchange. So this is AREX. This was actually based in the late, uh, in the late 1990s in Arizona. Um, and it started as a website. It, um, again, the, the Craigslist model, the listings for needed and available materials. Um, it started out with a lot of, in, um, a large amount of interest and just over time, it just uh, kind of dropped down and was eventually salvaged by Earth 911. And uh, over time, the, as the name changed and um, ownership changes, it's, it's, a, it's a different thing now. It's not the Arizona Resource Exchange anymore. Um, so the challenges that they face and that sort of led to the inactivity of this program was um, having much more of a supply of materials than a demand for these reused materials. They also weren't able to offer incentives for companies to participate. Again, it was in the late 1990s. There, um, it was harder to track these materials and, um, and be able to share the, um, the successes of the program across the state and get more people at, um, participating. So uh, fewer incentives, they didn't have as much uh, promotion for the program. Marie, before you move off of that one, uh, so Dr. Nick Hill was involved with this. He was one of the founders of it, as I recall. Uh, I don't know if you ever got a hold of him for, as a person to interview, but uh, he's uh, also one of the professors emeritus for the uh, ERM program, the founder of the ERM program. But uh, you know, I, I was a part of this one also back in the 90s. And I can tell you that it was all volunteers. You know, there might have been a little bit of seed money at the beginning, but it was 90 plus percent, if not 100 percent after that seed money dried up, yeah. voluntary efforts. And, uh, you know, that's, that's really hard to keep something going when it, there's no money, there's no uh, you know, revenue or fees or anything like that. So. Yeah, um, needing consistent funding was, was very much um, emphasized throughout these programs, um, for sure. I, I saw that you interviewed uh, Rob Barnett about this one. So yeah, he used to, uh, he just recently retired from ADEQ and was, like I say, without any funding, trying to keep it alive. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I was hoping to speak to Dr. Heald, um, but I wasn't able to in time for the presentation. So if I have some time, I'll reach out to him um, early next week and see if I can get a section in for him in the report itself. Um, but yeah. Well, he might have some recommendations for uh, you know, keeping all these other waste exchanges moving forward. It looks like there's some really successful models that you found. Uh, go yeah. ahead. Go ahead. Um, so the next section of this report is the industrial recycling survey. So this was a survey that I based off of the, um, the survey that was conducted pre-launch for the Michigan materials marketplace. So I based a lot of my questions on them as well as uh, on their survey. And I also added a few additional questions specifically related to Arizona. So I designed the survey on Google Forms. I had some single and multiple selection questions and some optional short answers to get um, specific feedback from the companies for um, the ADEQ uh, programs that would be um, administrating the materials marketplace. So my questions related to the demographics of these companies, their post-production recycling habits, and their supply and reuse habits. Um, my disclaimer for this survey that I, I let all of the uh, participants know 
uh, was that there's no collection of personal information or uh, company information in the final report or in this uh, presentation. So no names, no phone numbers, company names, um, nothing is included. And all, volu all participation was completely voluntary. So this, um, uh, this survey was designed to help me understand the types of materials that Arizona companies are recycling and reusing and some of the challenges that these industries are facing in, um, in their material recycling and reuse. So out of the companies that I contacted, I had a, well, I, I started with a list of 300 company names that I took from, uh, as a random selection from the EPA toxic release inventory list and the, the Arizona P2 participant lists. So out of a list of 300, 35%, I was unable to find con up to date contact information for, or the initial person I was able to reach the receptionist. Um, opted out on the basis of no one in the time, no one in the company who would have time or um, or um, the company wasn't doing recycling and so they weren't um, interested in participating. Even though not, a company not recycling is good data, is important data to have, most of them um, uh, decided to opt out. 44% uh, I was directed to um, a, an employee who would be able to respond to the survey uh, but was unable to reach them and so left a voicemail that wasn't returned or the employee I reached uh, decided to opt out. 13% of the uh, out of the 300 did agree to provide email addresses and out of them 24 or 8% of the 300 submitted responses and go over what they said about Arizona. So about um, about 20, I believe, of the companies that did respond were based in this like, central Arizona area in the Yavapai, uh, Maricopa, and Pinal counties. Um, most of the responders to the, e to the survey were environmental health and safety staff, so people who are very much aware of what's going on in their company in terms of the, the environmental uh, side of things. So for their recycling results, most of the recycled materials are in the form of metal, cardboard, or paper with also some plastic and uh, wood and glass. Some of the barriers that responses indicated were cost of recycling, so either in the form of storage or um, transportation or simply cost of having someone come pick up recycling. Um, and then also no local recycling options, so certain materials it's harder to find places that will accept that as a, uh, as a recycling. Uh, drop off. Also lack of adequate staff, corporate support, and space for doing the recycling and having containers to store them. Specific feedback for ADEQ um, included developing a network with a, a list of people and materials, so something like the materials marketplace. Also providing incentives and financial assistance for companies to develop uh, recycling programs and to have the, the training and education to uh, to provide for their employees so that they can get more, um, more employee participation. For supply and reuse, um, uh, most of the reused materials are metal, wood, and cardboard, um, but also pallets, polystyrene, and plating solutions. Most of these reused materials were indicated as coming from another, directly from another business, or um, uh, in a, a, the majority were directly from their own production line. The, the barriers to reusing materials in their process, either from their own line or from another company's, were um, largely specification requirements. So a certain material that is being put into a production line needs to have a certain level of quality. It needs to be either a certain size or um, a certain chemical makeup. And then additionally, the cost of recycled over raw. Sometimes it's a uh, the cost of recycled is actually higher than the cost of a raw material. Sometimes it's a perceived cost and it's just easier to go with the raw. Uh, the specific feedback for ADEQ for uh, supply and reuse were uh, mandating recycling and uh, making it harder to dispose of waste in a landfill and then also developing a network to connect the people and materials. So for um, this discussion, my areas of focus were um, heavily in program involvement, where I talk about consultations and liability issues, 
um, the industry. So looking at what some of the concerns are and um, the potential of uh, additional surveys, looking at the connections that a program like this can make either with P2 or um, local nonprofits and um, then promotion of the, uh, of the program to increase activity and interest from companies. And then funding, looking at service fees and grant funding. So program involvement, um, very much looking at the liability of a program getting too involved in the transaction. So almost every single program, except for Iowa, emphasized being very careful about how much you get involved in the program. And uh, in terms of hazardous waste, you don't want to uh, trigger um, Resource Conservation Recovery Act and transfer storage and disposal facility regulations or Department of Transportation. So you want to avoid transporting, storing the, any hazardous materials that are offered. Um, and so in general, it was advised by um, program administrators in the case studies to avoid getting involved in the transactions any more than helping to make the connections. Um, and in Iowa, they do have consultants and specialists who uh, provide waste stream advice and do waste assessments for companies. But again, it's providing expert advice. And these people know what they're doing. They, they are um, professionals, uh, engineers, and people who understand um, regulations, but they're not saying do this or accept this material. They're simply suggesting ideas for um, these companies to, uh, to look into listing on the website. They're providing resources and not personal opinions. So programs need to remain as a transaction site and not be providing full service in terms of physically getting involved. Um, the industries, uh, their, their main concerns seem to be the, the cost concerns um, in terms of um, the cost of recycled over raw. So being more transparent in, um, in, the benef in the financial benefits that these companies may see can help to increase, and, uh, increase activity and have more consistent activity. Um, free service may have higher activity levels but it depends on what is being offered in the service. If you are simply a listings website, it's, it may be easier. Or, or if, you're, if you're a listings website, and especially if you're connected to a government program that provides you that funding, free service may be an easier option to offer companies. Um, but if you are offering more services, if you are a nonprofit and you need to have ways to be supporting, uh, to, to be, um, paying the bills for the software and the people who are um, running the program, then um, service charges may, uh, may be the best option. Um, supply and demand, people need to, um, under the pe people need resources and, and, and um, ways to help them understand the, the different materials that are being offered on these exchanges and to um, find their need to have ways to find materials that meet their specifications and quality requirements to help balance that supply and demand because consistently across case across the case studies you we find that there's usually more supply than the demand of these products so um, it's harder to encourage industries to stay active in a program that's not getting them any benefits because no one's taking their materials. And again, a lot of these companies like confidentiality. They have proprietary materials and processes that they want to protect. Um, and that can be an issue because you have fewer success stories that you can use in, in promotion and marketing to other companies. So you have to look at um, offering confidentiality and helping companies to, um, to understand um, sorry, and, and, and helping companies to, uh, to be more comfortable um, giving their, their data, um, helping companies to, um, to give their, to, to track their successes and to report their successes. And then surveys, um, uh, some notes on my survey and on Michigan survey. Uh, there is some negative and positive recycling biases associated with these surveys. So when you have a survey that's asking about recycling, you're gonna get more responses 
from people who already recycle, who are interested in doing that. But the people who are not recycling, the companies and facilities that are not currently recycling, they're more likely to opt out. Um, so your survey is biased towards those people who are doing recycling. So one potential uh, follow-up could be that uh, Arizona Department of Environmental Quality looks at doing a, you know, an official survey uh, that targets a wider audience and specifically looks at those who are not recycling and looking at what their challenges and their barriers are and making their uh, the terminology accessible and, and helping people to understand what they mean when uh, when we talk about circular economy and um, and sustainability and using terms that can be understood by a wide audience um, so that the idea of participating in a circular economy survey isn't so um, isn't so scary uh, for connections we look at um, I looked at marketing so how do you actively look for companies so as mentioned for Iowa you can use consultants to go out and talk to companies you know uh, face to face or or make, or make connections over the phone or email and, and uh, make those physical connections um, attendance at conferences and trade fairs is uh, vital to be getting the the word out to people and companies who would actually be participating and then having a presence on social media uh, as mentioned for renew um, really getting where the audiences are and spreading that word making uh, circular economy and waste exchanges an accessible program for people who even aren't in co uh, companies but helping consumers to see the importance of uh, of these waste exchanges and finding alternative disposal methods so that they can provide that feedback to companies and demand that this is what they want and then emphasizing the benefits the financial benefits specifically to companies we'd like to say that companies off, um, operate on goodwill and that they'll recycle and um, out of the, the goodness of their heart, but in reality, they have to meet their bottom line. They, they're making money and saving money. So emphasizing those financial benefits is key to getting a participation. Um, more connections, um, additional services, being flexible in what you're offering, looking at your clients and your customers and understanding what their needs are, whether they need an exchange or if a directory would also be useful for them. Um, offering matchmaking events was a, a suggestion in the, um, in the industry survey I conducted. So looking at what, um, what companies could be matched up with these other companies. Offering a newsletter, so keeping the word going, not just talking to someone once, but um, emails and uh, consistent, uh, consistent advertisements to companies. And then partnerships. So again, with the P2 program, um, the, the Arizona P2 program has been around long enough that a lot of the companies that are participating are sort of reaching the end of what else can we do? They've been saving energy and conserving water. They've reduced their, their uh, chemical usage or made substitutions where possible. What else can they do? So a material or waste exchange can help renew the P2 program and um, and give companies uh, another op like more opportunities and, and options for um, for their their P2 goals. Also, partnering with local nonprofits like uh, Treasure for Te Treasures for Teachers and Habitat for Humanity. So not just recycling your uh, a, a, a company's materials and surpluses, but donating them back to the community and helping to support that local community. And finally, funding. So uh, some, some programs, some waste exchange programs are not for profit and they may be based on grant funding and donations and having government partnerships like with the P2 programs. Um, other companies are for profit. They uh, you know, have service subscription and transaction fees and they often are based on city and state contracts. Um, regardless of the model that the waste exchange uses, consistent funding is vital. So um, being able to ensure funding from one year to the next to maintain ability to promote and market, to keep uh, websites updated and engaging, and to be able to hire more people to help support the program as it grows. The funding is often dependent on the state of the economy, so that is something to be aware that as economy goes down, activity on the state, uh, on, on the exchanges may go down. And then fees of any kind may be a barrier for some companies who are new companies or struggling to make a profit. 
and, and there may need to be other options for these companies as they, um, as they may still have valuable materials to list on the program, but can't if there is a, a financial barrier. So my recommendations for the state of Arizona are to conduct an official state survey to get additional and more accurate responses, especially targeting those companies that are not currently recycling and understanding why they're not recycling and what can the state do to help them. Uh, two, state P2 programs can act as incentives for company participation and the waste exchange can help to renew their P2 goals. Three, avoid active participation in the transactions for liability and legality issues, especially when uh, you're looking at uh, the Resource Conservation Recovery Act or RICRA and hazardous waste. Uh, four, maintain real-time data so that you can be transparent about the waste diversion volumes and the weights, cost savings especially, and um, possibly even CO2 savings, and make it available to participants and to the public. Uh, five, consultation, uh, consultants, uh, retired engineers, or other uh, professionals can look through facilities and manufacturing processes. They can find uh, valuable um, reusable waste streams that maybe they missed. And uh, they can also find businesses to participate and do face-to-face -face meetings and really promote the exchange. Uh, six, uh, attend conferences, workshops, and trade fairs to spread awareness to a wide audience. I know that the uh, recycling program and the uh, P2 program at ADEQ are already very active in going to conferences and trade fairs, um, but also maintain an active presence on social media as well and keep the user interfaces updated and engaging um, make them interesting for people to be on and easy to navigate. Seven, offer both, both a listing site and a directory for users um, to consult either one depending on what their waste streams need and what their quality and quantity needs are. Eight, connect with local nonprofits and material reuse businesses. So as mentioned, the Treasures for Teachers and the Habitat for Humanity. So help to benefit local communities and organizations. And that provides an additional benefit to the company in increase in um, improving their, their reputation. Um, and number nine, offering a free service removes cost barriers from participation. So companies may create an account uh, out of interest to see what the listings are. And if they find listings that interest them, they may stay active. 10, look into grant funding from multiple sources. So even if the exchange is already included in state or city budgets, um, in this case, the um, Arizona Department of Environmental Quality, their materials marketplace is gonna be connected with the P2 and recycling program. So it's already sort of gonna be funded, but make sure that you can ensure that funding from multiple sources, so have backups. And 11, additional community and company outreach, really um, offering education and training efforts and um, resources for these companies so they can improve relations between their employees, their companies, and other companies. So the, 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 the success of a waste exchange program is dependent on understanding the current waste and recycling situation of the companies in the area that they're serving. Also tra being transparent in the results and emphasizing the financial benefits to these companies. Uh, it's also dependent on recognizing the challenges that may come in finances, supply and demand, and marketing, and having a plan for uh, meeting those challenges and overcoming them. And finally, being flexible in the services that are offered to meet the individual company and waste stream needs of the region you're in. So I wanted to to say thank you so much for coming to my presentation and for the people who have supported me, especially to my husband who is with the kids right now so that I have a quiet house. <laughs> um, so thank you to him and thank you to my family and my friends and uh, thank you for participating. Uh, what questions do you have for me? Okay, so uh, traditionally, we start out with uh, the guests asking questions, and then the faculty. Uh, I did not have any questions that came up during the actual lectures, or the actual lecture, so, or the presentation, Marie. So why don't we just uh, go around the screen and see uh, if any of the guests and your friends and supporters and your fans out there have questions.
about the uh, students who were on uh, Marie's team. I see there are several of you logged in right now. She led a fantastic team there in our uh, sustainable solid waste class uh, where we assisted the city of Peoria this semester in coming up with uh, ideas for them to improve textiles and mm -hmm. styrofoam recycling. And uh, Marie led the styrofoam recycling group, produced a really excellent report. So uh, I don't have a question, but I do have a comment. Uh, Marie, I'm very impressed. Uh, this is a lot of information. Definitely tell you've done a lot of research. So yeah, this is great. Congratulations. Thank you. <laughs> And I, I have to add really quick, my team was absolutely phenomenal for the Peoria project. So I'm, I am very grateful that they were able to take some time and come watch this and see what else um, I've been doing. And because it, it fit pretty well in, in with our presentation. So thank you guys for coming. Uh, I, I have just a quick comment, uh, Marie, and I enjoyed uh, talking to you uh, and answering some of the questions you had about the activities we have. We, we do do the reuse marketplace uh, and we do quite a few other um, waste exchanges as well. Each one kind of a little different version uh, depending on the um, situation we we find ourselves in. You mentioned hazardous waste uh, on waste exchanges and uh, we've had two experiences with that. Uh, one was a waste exchange that wanted to list hazardous waste on their exchange and to handle it um, discreetly or delicately so they didn't run afoul of uh, regulations. And I think the way we handled that was to uh, ensure that the information about the hazardous waste, you know, had, had a hazardous waste assessment been done on it. And uh, if so, could you please uh, you provide a link to that assessment so we know what's in it? And then uh, we posted some some cautions about buyers and sellers or uh, generators and consumers of hazardous waste uh, to make sure that the waste exchange wasn't uh, didn't have liability in terms of uh, dealing in hazardous waste and so on. Uh, we also had a request at one point from Washington D.C about an exclusively hazardous waste waste exchange that would just focus on hazardous waste as they had a problem with it. Have you, did you run across any other examples of, of hazardous waste actually being exchanged on a waste exchange and or uh, a waste exchange which, which focused exclusively on hazardous waste? Um, I didn't find any waste exchanges that their sole focus was um, hazardous waste. Um, but in general, when talking to the different program administrators, they, uh, they would mention that yes, hazardous waste was accepted, but I get the feeling that it's not very common simply because of uh, the RICRA regulations and making sure that you're, right. you're not breaking the law and doing anything and, and following the hazardous waste recycling laws. Right, so the same issue we faced, which was to make sure that we do due, due diligence when somebody wants to to uh, to um, transact in hazardous waste on a on a general waste exchange. Thank you. I really like the that that you mentioned that you do the uh, that that the, they do the hazardous waste assessments and provide that as part of the the listing. That's a that's a really good idea. That's that's great. Hey, Marie, could you uh, stop the screen share so that we can see everybody's images better? And, you know, during the discussion, it's always nice that people can turn on their image and microphone so we have a robust discussion. They're all welcome to do that. Yeah, hi, Marie. Thanks for, uh, thanks for the invite to, to yeah. join today and, yeah, and great, uh, great work on the, the presentation as well. It was really interesting. Um, as and it was a, a really nice nice to get an insight into some of the things going on in the, the Arizona context as well. Um, as as you know, we we have a lot of interaction with uh, economic development agencies in in a lot of our projects. And I was wondering if any elements of your research veered in in that direction as well. If, if you know if folks from 
the folks that are looking at this reuse and recycling marketplace from an economic development perspective and potential for job growth and all of that. Any insights there? Um, unfortunately, not too many insights on that. I did reach out to the, the Corporation Commission and they, they weren't really able to provide me with any. It wasn't something that looked at um, and they don't do anything with crafting industrial waste, unfortunately. Gotcha. So it sounds like in Arizona, it's mostly uh, ADEQ's P2 program mm -hmm. in terms of the most active local opportunity for this kind of stuff. Yeah, so the P2 program that they have participants from all across the state. Um, and, and, and as mentioned, most of them are in manufacturing. There are some that um, in, you know, in education and, and bioscience and, um, and a good portion in retail as well. But currently that's the that is the, the option for, um, for helping industries to reduce their, uh, their waste. That one is fairly limited, I think, unless they have somehow find a, found a way to expand uh, to the TRI and tier two reporters. You know, if you're uh, generating at least, uh, or using at least 10,000 pounds per year of something that's on the list of lists, uh, then you have to file a, a tier two and, and also a toxic release inventory report. And that triggers also a P2 report. Yes. And, you know, that report is mandatory. And so is ADEQ P2 program offering services that go beyond what's mandatory and beyond toxic stuff? Um, the, the program is also open to uh, voluntary participation. So there are um, a number of companies, I, I don't know the exact number, uh, but there are a number of companies in the program that are doing so completely voluntarily just out of wanting to reduce their waste, even though they don't, um, they're not triggering that requirement. That's good to hear. And are they just getting money from an EPA grant then? Or are they collecting some fees from companies? How, how is that program funded? So P2 is, um, it's, a, it's a program within ADEQ. Um, I'm, I'm not 100% sure how the P2 program is actually funded. I think it's simply just included in the state budget. Um, yeah, that's, I, I didn't go too much into the financial side for that. Okay. I think it's grant funded from EPA, but... Uh, other uh, people on the call here want to uh, ask questions. In the uh, in the breakdown of your uh, survey responses, um, do you, the the response rate on those? Do you do you have a a further breakdown of how many of those responses were from your P two list and how many of those were from the the TRI list? Unfortunately, I don't. Once I collected the, the random selection from the two lists, um, I, all I did was um, have the company names and then uh, I got I looked at their phone numbers on Google and then got employee addresses. And then once I had what I needed, the, the list was um, deleted simply for the privacy sake. So because that, there were some companies that specifically um, wanted to make sure that their information wasn't going to be spread around. And once, once I ensured them, assured them that that was the case, that, you know, once this was over, that, that file's being deleted, that no information's going in the report. Um, so w regardless of where I got their name, um, that it, it wasn't going to be, be spread around. Because there were some companies that were curious how I got their name. And so I was able to tell them it was from the TRI or the, the P2 list, but um, I couldn't tell them which one because I, it was easier mm -hmm. not to know and, and to have, going to um, calls and uh, to companies with preconceived notions. Got it, yeah, interesting. Yeah, we've had s similar low response rates uh, contacting companies from, from TRI data, but the, the P2 programs, the, the folks that are involved there always seem very willing to, to work with us. So that's just a, an observation from our, our end of things. Yeah, the, the Michigan survey, um, they, they had a, a pretty low response rate. I, I thought mine was low. It was higher than I thought it would be. I thought I was going to get 10 max, but then mm -hmm. I ended up with 24, and I was like, yes. So I was pretty happy with that. And then I went back and looked at the Michigan survey, and they had a 
pretty similar response rate. So I actually felt pretty good, although they reached out to like several thousand people. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, um, yeah, yeah, I'm not surprised. I don't feel bad about that. I was involved with a federal grant from FEMA a few years ago. I think we reached out to 3,800 some schools. These were colleges and universities. And we out wound up with about uh, 40 of them. So, you know, 10% mm -hmm. or less. So don't worry about it. It's, uh, it's typical. Uh, I wanted to mention also about uh, the ASU Institutional Review Board process. Uh, you did go through that. Do you want to tell everybody, you know, that this got approved? That might yeah. make some people feel comfortable who are concerned about the uh, sharing of information. So actually it was brought up um, by, I believe it was Al, when I was about 90% done with my survey that I should probably put it through the, the board of review to make sure that the survey was approved. I didn't realize I had to do that. <laughs> so I reached out to them and I let them know, um, you know, the, I, I think I sent a copy of the survey so they could see the survey questions and make sure that nothing I was asking was, ask, was getting personal information. Um, and make sure that it, it met all the, the code of ethics for surveys and such. And it, it was approved, luckily, because that would have been awful to be almost done. Because <laughs> I started that survey back uh, halfway through the summer, uh, started collecting responses. So that would have been rough. <laughs> so luckily, I, I had already planned on making sure that it was completely private. There's no information from companies um, going, on, going on this one. I it will. reminds me of the old, old adage that it's easier to get uh, forgiveness than permission, but maybe that's what they did. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I was, uh, I was careful to say, that to, to not add that, you know, I'm already almost done, but can you approve this? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we, we discussed the exact words to use before. Yeah. Uh, I think that helped. Uh, let's see, another thing that is... Uh, uh, something that's a challenge is the with homeland security issues nowadays uh, because of the concern about terrorism and act uh, I guess access to confidential information about uh, chemicals. You know, there are several new um, confidentiality laws and rules and regulations in place that were not in place before 9/11. And uh, that will inhibit the sharing of chemical information, especially that you can get from anybody, including the government agencies. Because even the government agencies cannot share stuff that's, uh, that's on the list. You know, for example, information about cyanide or uh, specific quantities of uh, sodium nitrate. You know, there's, a, there's a list of about 300 chemicals that uh, that we don't want the bad guys getting their hands on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and uh, uh, Renew did specify, uh, the, the Renew program uh, did specify that they do uh, re review of the, the listings, especially international, because they want to, to make sure that they're preventing any scams or any potential issues like that. They didn't specifically mention um, home, the Department of Homeland Security, but that is definitely something to, to watch out for to make sure that people are legitimate on the website. Yeah, so just keep uh, looking over your shoulder, uh, you know, looking at your rearview mirror. Uh, you know, you might have triggered some key buzzword on the Homeland Security uh, search engine while you were doing this. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Marie, you talked about the uh, importance of funding um, and, and also the role of ADEQ. So suppose you had a position at ADEQ uh, <clears throat> where you were going to be able to implement uh, a program that you really wanted, that you could design and, and uh, run, uh, but you had to go down to the state legislature and get funding for it, um, you know, argue for it to be included in the budget. What, what arguments would you make to the legislature about why this is important for the state of Arizona, why they should spend some money on it? Well, I think I would take a lot of the data that I've collected in terms of the, the financial uh, successes and the, the CO2 savings um, and um, how much these, these companies can benefit in terms of 
the money that they're saving and the money that they're making, but also the very much the waste amount. So, I mean, in, in, in Arizona, we have a very large population in this central Arizona region, and we only have so many landfills. We only have so much space for landfills. And once um, landfills start to migrate further away from the city, that's more transportation costs, that's permitting fees, that, that's so much more um, than you know it is currently. Um, so to help avoid uh, filling these landfills faster than necessary with, um, let's see, there was a statistic um, that I read and it's hard to confirm this because again, industrial waste is hard to quantify uh, exactly, but the estimates are that industrial to municipal um, waste production is about 97 to three. So 97% of waste is from indus industry. So any reduction that we can make on that and avoiding the waste being disposed in the landfill is a benefit for the entire state because we don't have to create so many landfills and take up public lands with, um, with more and more landfills from these industries. If we can keep them in the, um, in the, um, in the economy and uh, being reused. And as Daniel mentioned, looking into the, the economics of it and uh, getting um, accountants involved and understanding how the, um, how this program can financially benefit the, the state. So th those are some of the, the data, uh, some of the data that I would, that I would need to present in order to, to. You're saying 97% of what's in a landfill comes from industry? That is the estimate. Um, the number is a little, it, it's hard that there were, there are a few places to say that's the most commonly um, quoted number. But again, it's complete, completely based on estimates um, without having reporting from industry itself. It's hard to get more accurate. And unfortunately, it's the same with their rates of recycling. So the amount that, the amount of their waste that is actually being recycled, we, we don't really know. That companies tend to be more open about the amounts that they're recycling but we don't know percentages because then we would know the amounts of waste. Okay, do we have I, any I other numbers uh, that for every uh, person um, for residential waste, um, I'm in Ontario about, uh, I don't know, 1,600 um, pounds per person per year. And then beside that, I saw the figure of about 35 uh, tons of waste per person per year for the Wasteburg that, that, that supports that. Uh, underlying that one ton per person per year of consumer waste, um, I've seen the number 35. I haven't uh, delved into that anymore, but it's a number that's being floated around for the circular economy. Yeah, there's a there's a pretty wide wide range, for sure. A number that I'm familiar with, I just punched up in my calculator, is uh, the average per capita waste generation of municipal solid waste, which is a, a broad category, and it also includes commercial waste, uh, not necessarily industrial hazardous waste, that would not be part of this number, but it's 4.5 pounds per day. So that comes out to 1,642.5 pounds per year. That seems right. kind of consistent with what Norm just said. What was your number, Norm? Yeah, it, it was around 1,600 pounds per person per year. Yeah, and absolutely. then for the industrial waste, it wasn't just industrial for the 35 tons that I saw, it was uh, industrial, agricultural, uh, construction and demolition and so on. Uh, everything else other than what's, uh, what's generated into the municipal system. Uh, and really that would go back all the way to, to China in some cases. So it's not all ours, mm -hmm. you know, it's, it's everything from mining all the way up, uh, mining and, and drilling uh, pipelines and, and whatever. And the mining industry generates uh, just an incredible volume of waste. You know, if you look at the 
TRI reports. Arizona is one of the largest uh, generators of TRI toxic waste in the United States, and that's mostly it is because of our mines. You know, the, even just mine tailings or uh, overburdened waste rock. Uh, you know, if it's coming from a copper mine, for example, it has a you know very very small amount of stuff in there like cobalt and lead and arsenic and even copper, you know, that they can't mine economically. That's on the list, that's the so-called list of lists. And so we end up with uh, basically mountains, literally mountains of this stuff being generated every year and reported on the toxic release inventory. It's all legally uh, allowed, you know, they can, if a mine has a, a permit to operate, they can generate that kind of waste, but it has to be reported. And so it makes it makes that number, you know, a lot larger than you know, what than what most people conceive waste to be. So. Marie, if uh, if in fact in the next few years, uh, decades, uh, climate change and funding for uh, different strategies to, to impact climate change is substantially different from it is now. Do you see that as a way to really influence the reuse and recycling aspect? In other words, spending more time and effort looking at climate change impacts uh, and, and, and maybe being able to tap into some funding from that source as a way to support some of these initiatives that you've been talking about? I think if, um, if the, there's a more of a focus on the climate change and funding increases for research into that, we can definitely um, gear the, the, the benefits promotion towards the climate change and talk more about the CO2 savings and, um, and uh, less landfill gases, et cetera. Um, but if, there is less of a focus that it's going to be a lot harder and we'll have to focus more on uh, reaching out to the companies and promoting the financial benefits to them. So I, I think, you know, I, one way or the other, you know, I think it will definitely affect the emphasis of the, the promotion of the program. Well, that was a very good presentation. I, I enjoyed it. Thanks for all of your work putting that together. Thank you. I, I really enjoyed this project. I, I first uh, conceived of the project when I was watching um, uh, J.B. Shaw at the Arizona Department of Environmental Quality. He's the recycling coordinator and he was giving a presentation on the recycling program at ADEQ and he mentioned that they wanted to work with uh, Materials Marketplace and, I, and he talked a little bit about what the marketplace was and I was like that's really fascinating. And I talked to him later and, and learned a little bit more about it. And I was like, you know what, like what has been done to, to see how much this, how successful this program can be in Arizona. I was like, there's my project. I, I will admit, Al, initially I was going to do the cumulative exam because I was like, you know, it, it, it is a little bit, it seems to be a little bit easier. I don't think the exam is easy, I'm sure. But it seemed to be a little bit easier in terms of time. But I realized that this was something that, I was feeling very passionate about and that got me excited. I was like, okay, I think I have to research this. <laughs> so I might as well make it my applied project. So I, I'm glad that, that you guys seem to have enjoyed it. And, and uh, I think my husband will be glad that it's, it's done and I can stop talking to him about it every day. <laughs> well, you're truly a model student, there's no doubt about, uh, in many, many ways. Uh, we normally, when we're uh, you know, doing one of these thesis defenses, uh, will uh, the, the faculty committee, the, your so-called graduate committee, we will dismiss or ask all the guests to step out of the room for a few minutes while uh, we deliberate and decide your fate, uh, whether or not you're going <laughs> to graduate. Uh, so that's the traditional academic way, you know. <laughs> But since we're on a on a Zoom meeting, I vote she graduate. Oh, you're you're on mute. I vote she graduate. <laughs> okay, so now it's up to me to cast the deciding vote. 
we're not we're not going to dismiss all the, the people online would have we're not going to do that that's too much trouble uh so uh congratulations Ari. i concur with dr olson and uh you have achieved the master of science and environmental and resource management of course you haven't turned in your fi all your final exams yet but i'm sure there'll be a's not wor after this i'm not worried about those <laughs> Those are, you know, piece of pie. Yeah, you've uh, you've been put through the ringer on this one. I'll say I've, I'm a I'm a tough reviewer when it comes to the written materials, the written work po products. But you're also one of our best writers, uh, so thank you very much for that skill too that, that you bring to to the profession. I'm sure you'll do well in anything that you attempt after graduating. Are there any other uh, comments from the people online? Your mom, your sister, fellow students? Mom is here. <laughs> can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Okay. It, the the um, audio is very grainy on my end. I'm sorry. I am very proud of Marie. <laughs> Of course, I'm her mom, but also just to see, um, just awesome, wonderful job. Well done, well presented. You hold, held yourself very, very well, and I just wanted to congratulate you. Um, and I will say, my, I appreciate mom, yeah, the, my mom did, <laughs> I, I had her do some editing on my report for grammar. I, I've done that since like high school, middle school. She she looks through my papers and catches things I never would. So, so she she was a, an additional editor. <laughs> uh, uh, I'll pipe up. Con congratulations, Marie. It was a pleasure uh, speaking with you when you interviewed me, and it's been nice to meet uh, two of your your professors and mentors and lecturers from Arizona State University, and uh, it's uh, and also your team and your family. So congratulations and stay in touch. Uh, um, Daniel and I both do material exchanges and normally we'd be competitors possibly. Uh, my view of uh, material exchanges right now is that there is a lot of space for growth in the area. Yeah. And um, Daniel tackles and his group tackles one end of it. Uh, we do it a little different version of it and we're finding all kinds of opportunities right now uh, in all kinds of places. So I think you picked a really good subject for, for your uh, thesis. And uh, uh, as I said, I'll be happy to um, continue to uh, collaborate with you and uh, consider you now a colleague. Thanks a lot. Thank you.